After a 10 month break, the Gulls are back on the ice. Agazino scores! We'll get you caught up on the plans for this season. We'll take a look at some of the team's most dedicated fans, and we'll have a look at how the Gulls continue to have an impact in the San Diego community despite the pandemic. Gulls All Access begins now. For Garrett Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Gauls All Access for the 2021 season from Great Park Ice in Irvine. I'm Andy Zilch, here from the temporary home of the San Diego Gauls, so the players can be in a COVID safe bubble with the highest safety protocols in mind for the coaches, players, and staff. It's been a long road to get to this day. The last AHL game was played on March 11th when the Gauls defeated the Tucson Roadrunners by a score of four to two. Exactly two months later, the AHL canceled the remainder of the 2019-2020 season due to the ongoing COVID-19 public health crisis. Then, hope arose for the AHL on July 30th when league president and CEO Scott Housen announced that December 4th was an anticipated start date for the new season. That made sense because just two days later, the NHL prepared to resume play within COVID-protected bubbles in Canada where they planned to award the Stanley Cup. As December 4th neared, it was unfathomable to begin at that time. So Housen announced moving the anticipated start date to February 5th. Finally, on January 22nd, a schedule for the upcoming season was released, officially giving the San Diego Gulls a February 5th start date. The man leading the Gulls front office through these challenging times is the team's president of business operations. I visited with Matt Savant via Zoom earlier this week to give you, the fans, some answers. Can you give fans the reasoning and the mindset behind the Gulls moving to Irvine to play at Great Park Ice here at Five Point Arena? Well, the, the first piece that I want to say is this is a temporary move. We are the San Diego Gulls. We will be back in San Diego as soon as it's deemed uh, responsible and safe to come back to San Diego. So that said, the reason we moved up to Irvine was to be closer to the Anaheim Ducks and the Anaheim Ducks training staff and all the doctors and all the facilities that go along with the Anaheim Ducks and the San Diego Goals. We wanted to put them all under one roof. We wanted to make sure that all the protocols and all of the uh, guidance that the AHL and NHL has given us is in place and make sure that our, our players, our staff, our trainers, our coaches, everybody is as safe as possible. So really it was a safety move. Uh, we moved up to Irvine. We're gonna play at a beautiful Five Points Arena for uh, the foreseeable future. If San Diego and the state of California allow us to come back, we will come back because we really miss our fans. We've had a couple of preseason games already, and uh, it's just not the same without America's Finest fans in the arena. Well, I have a two-pronged question for you. First being, do we have a targeted end date for this? And the second prong to that would be, are the Gulls going to play at the Pechanga Arena this season? So right now we're looking at it as a month by month process and um, we'll have a feeling of if state guidelines start to ease a little bit and county guidelines start to ease a little bit, it is our plan to come back to Pechanga Arena and play right here in San Diego. If that doesn't take place and we're going to uh, stay up at five points, it's our, it'll be our plan to stay up there as long as we have to. If that means the, the entire regular season and playoffs, we'll do that. But as soon as we're allowed to come back, it's our plan to come back. I will say that comes with a caveat. If we are uh, in a spot where we have two, three, four games left, it probably doesn't make financial sense to ask the arena to pour the ice, uh, get everything ready for a hockey season, which traditionally takes a few weeks to get everything ready. Um, if we're only having one or two weeks of hockey left, we'll probably stay. Uh, but ultimately, it's our plan to be back. And uh, at the very uh, least, we'll want to make sure we're back for the start of next season with as many fans as it is allowed and uh, get back to what we're used to, which is an amazing atmosphere at Pechanga Arena for goals games. We'll have more with Matt later in the show. Coming up next, 
The Gulls haven't let COVID-19 stop them from helping out in the community as Gulls All Access continues. Welcome back. We often hear the players talk about how important the San Diego Gulls fans are. And until the team is back playing at the Pachanga Arena, these fans will be dearly missed. There's no questioning their dedication. In early January, when the Gulls asked for some help with the blood drive, Gulls fans showed heart and devotion to their team and our great city. This is actually an event that we were hoping to put on earlier this year in March of 2020. We had to push pause, but we're here back. It's the first blood drive for the San Diego Blood Bank of this calendar year. And we're really excited to be here today. We have over 100 people coming to donate blood. We're gonna save hundreds of lives. And we're really proud and happy of how this event has turned out given the pandemic. Our average blood drive is usually between 20 and 30 people. With the goals helping promote this blood drive, we've had over 108 people sign up today. So it's four times the average size. Plus again, it's the first drive of the year. The fact that we can use this opportunity to give back to the community and fill it for such a vital function like the blood bank and then partner with our new partners as of last year, the SD Gold. Um, just means a lot. But we're giving back and that's what's most important and that makes you feel good and especially in a year that people are in need. Thank you to those who gave blood, so many of them sporting their Gulls colors. While we're on the subject of dedication, there's a very brave young man from Point Loma who the Gulls met through Rady Children's Hospital. Carter Santos has been a Gulls fan for some time. Now, however, the Gulls are fans of his, and you will be too. I'm Carter Santos. I'm Carter Santos. I'm Carter Santos. Carter was five years old in 2018, and uh, December 11th, he was diagnosed with leukemia. I, I would have given anything to trade places with him in that moment. And when we um, went to Rady's ER, they did a ton of tests and they um, informed us that he had leukemia. Uh, I think the first couple of days after diagnosis was very logistical. Uh, you know, what does it mean? What type of leukemia does he have? What are the uh, success rates uh, uh, for, for treatment with Carter uh, being a, a child and so on? It's one of those things where you just realize, you know, we kind of use the phrase, together is better. And, and when we were all together, our spirits were better. I think the healing is better. I think the, the void is, it is a really hard one to fill. The bottom line is, is we were fighting to save his life and so um, it's a very serious time for him and a lot of it hurt you know the fort the poking the prodding the you know he was very tired and um he uh he rallied and, and it's amazing kids are so resilient and so strong um, but it's a process for sure um, and, and carter was he was pretty sick so he was pretty sick in the beginning, and so that was something that was, um, it's hard to watch as a parent, you know? You just, you want to take away the pain. So we ended up spending Christmas uh, at the hospital. What are the nurses like at the hospital, Carter? <laughs> they are amazing. The doctors are amazing. The nurses are amazing. The staff is amazing. The, uh, I mean, everyone there. It, that, it's so incredible. We're so blessed to, to live so close and to have Rains be a place that, that we were able to, to receive treatment there. Carter's mm -hmm. got some pretty special bonds with some of the nurses there. My favorite nurse in clinic, her favorite team was from Kenya, and my favorite team was from Oregon. And they were playing against each other to go to the finals, and um, we got um, donuts with. Um, green and yellow sprinkles on it and they put it in the nurse's office. She made a huge sign 
<laughs> this uh, Virginia sign and brought it into your room. Yeah. <laughs> One of the blessings of radius is they do um, genetic testing on the cancer cells. And so they found out that he had um, a condition called hyperdiploidy, which um, is not uncommon for them to call it, to take longer to respond to treatment. And so for Carter, because radius is so amazing and does a lot of testing, they were willing to wait a little bit longer um, to go into transplant, where usually kids would, at, at his point, would have had to have a bone marrow transplant. And so June 10th was the day that um, Dr. Quo and Lindsay and Sarah, we were all in clinic together, and Dr. Quo came in and ripped the curtains open, and he said, today is a good day to be cancer-free. So June 10th, 2019 is our cancer-free date, and we celebrate it like a birthday. The survival rates for children who have childhood cancers has fortunately been improving in recent years. 80% of, uh, of children who have cancer will go on, and then they will be in a long-term cancer survivor group, which unfortunately is a very high-risk group for certain things. So the Thriving After Cancer program provides needed therapies, including massage, healing tech, uh, biofeedback, cooking classes, acupuncture, massage, lots of really wonderful things that will help them have the best outcomes and really relies on philanthropy to provide. The goals have been fantastic. We really, they're a, an annual partner that we get to work with throughout the year on a number of initiatives. Um, they have uh, really helped to make our Brady Children's Ice Rink a big hit in recent years. We have usually over 40,000 skaters and um, San Diego Gold's Night is definitely uh, the most popular night of the season. You get to go out and you'll see patients and their families, nurses and doctors, as well as the community at large out there skating with their favorite players. It's really wonderful. They also fundraise with us throughout the year. Uh, it's, it's not a one time a year type of thing. This is a, a real partnership. We have a year end holiday event called uh, Light the Way, where we really focus on bringing the holiday magic to the kids, to the many kids, unfortunately, that have to spend the holidays in the hospital to be sure that they all know that they're, they're not alone, their community supports them, the San Diego Goals support them, and to provide a lot of fun. Being willing to accept that help uh, is is key to having a successful journey, uh, a positive as, as positive as possible, uh, and getting through something that is extremely extremely tough. He's spent over 96 days admitted in the hospital. He's received 17 blood transfusions, six platelet transfusions. He's had over 500 doses of chemotherapy, and he's been put under anesthesia 23 times. And so from now until April of 2022, he continues daily oral chemo. Um, he continues five days of steroids a month. And every 28 days, they access his port in his chest and they give him chemo via his port. He has six more times going under anesthesia. And um, so April 5th, 2022, he'll no longer have to do any of that. He can just kind of work on keeping strong and healthy and, and rolling through like a regular kid. I think Gulliver made a special delivery to your oh. mom and dad. So that is a team autograph jersey. Incredible, Carter. The Gulls and all of San Diego are proud of your bravery. Up next, we'll introduce you to some of the Gulls' loudest long-term supporters. Plus, we'll have some more info about the upcoming season with the team's president of business operations, Matt Savant. Sam Carrick scores! After this. Welcome back to Gulls All Access. Earlier, we heard from the team president of business operations, Matt Savant, about why the Gulls are playing in Irvine and how long that may last. In part two of my interview with Matt, we learn more on the abbreviated season. The 44 game schedule lies ahead for the San Diego Gulls. It is the largest schedule that the American Hockey League can boast, and that's the entire Pacific Division. 
With that being said, Matt, why is the goal schedule so much larger than everyone out east and in the central divisions? Really, we're looking at our young players. We've got a, a really strong, young group of players, many of which are not, uh, as of right now, able to play in the uh, major junior leagues, the OHL, WHL. So because of that, they're playing for the goals. And what we want to do is give those kids the opportunity to play as much hockey, as much high-level competitive hockey as possible. So the decision was made that we would uh, lead the league in total games played at 44. And uh, I, I think it's a great idea, and it's a great opportunity for these kids to uh, – really jump into pro hockey for their first year. And we have a lot of players that have been with the goals for a number of seasons and um, for them to continue to develop as well with the goal of ultimately getting up to Anaheim and playing at a very high level for the Ducks. With no fans in the building for the time being, how much of an importance is that for the Fox 5 televised games and for the AHL TV stream? We uh, really understand that our fans uh, are very passionate about goals hockey. They want to follow the team. They want to attend games. They want to watch games. That said, this year, because of COVID protocols, they're not able to attend games in person. So we've augmented our television schedule this year. Uh, we've got uh, many more games on Fox 5, and we're also reaching out to another partner here in San Diego uh, to have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 16 to 20 games televised this year. And on top of that, we've uh, augmented our AHL TV platform. We've brought in a few more uh, assets and a, a few more people to help bring that broadcast to life this year so that when our fans are watching at home, they're getting a close to a television quality broadcast even on AHL TV, especially for our home games where we're able to control the environment. We're really excited about these uh, upgrades and these opportunities for our fans to stay connected to the team and to our brand. How excited are you to see the goals brand back on the ice? I personally have missed hockey. I've missed goals hockey. And for us to finally get our preseason going and our regular season's right around the corner, for me, it feels like Christmas morning. I'm so excited to get back and uh, see what we have on the ice and see how these players start coming together and just get that rhythm back and get that understanding that the, uh, the goals are here, the goals are playing, and uh, our goal is to get back to San Diego as soon as possible, fill up the Pachanga Arena, get those crazy fans back. I, I just can't wait to get back into the rhythm of hockey, and this is a great start. Thanks again to Matt for taking the time. Well, there are many reasons we already miss games being played in San Diego. Of course, number one is the fans. They are amongst the loudest, most supportive groups in the AHL. Here's a look at a couple fanatics who do more than their part on game night. Yeah, it's kind of a, a team effort when we use the megaphone and the can. It's kind of a team effort. So I gave it to Dan because he's so much younger than me. And what happens <laughs> is you, you may notice that what happens is as soon as we score a goal that warrants any type of uh, chant from us, Dan starts waving that can. Sometimes he has to wave it four or five minutes, keep his arm up. I'm just not willing to put in that kind of effort. Also, the truth is that once I brought, started bringing the megaphone in, we realized we wanted two people to be able to handle this pressure. The can attracts the crowd, and then, then they join in with any chance that we might be able to give them. After we score a goal and we're up by uh, one point, so obviously uh, it would be the second goal, so two to one, then I hold this can up in the air and I wave it around. I keep it up in the air until after the announcer announces the goal. At that point, that's Fredo what, takes over. Yeah. At that point, then I, uh, whatever the goal count is, I'll smash it into the concrete, and it's pretty loud. And then we start with the chant, you know, whatever the goaltender's name is. We call him out, and then we count off the goals, tell him he sucks, he's a loser, and then I pound it into the concrete again. Pretty neat um, to have the whole arena doing a chant together, and everybody recognizes it. And you know, sometimes, like he was saying, if they go on break right at the time when uh, when you have to hold it up, you can have to hold it up for a long time. But it's uh, it gets the crowd going, and it's really fun. This is a really fun hockey tradition here in San Diego. Well, the design work is actually by yours truly. Uh, back in the day, the goals colors were blue and orange. You know, uh, were their primary colors. Obviously, there was always black involved. And so 
I painted it myself. And you know, I added the leather and the leather strap. I got that off some vintage Seuss case somewhere. And there it is. The can is uh, something that I actually inherited from a gentleman that was here before me. And when he passed away, they gave it to me. And so, so I believe the can was around, well, I, I know it was around at least from 2003. And before that, I had never met these folks, a gentleman named Mike. And, uh, you know, we, my, I, my season tickets used to be on the other end of the arena. And when we moved over to this side of the arena, we wanted to be near the can. And then after I received the can th uh, from Mike, uh, I went out and I found the megaphone and the megaphone's been hanging tough about 16 years now. When Mike had that cover made, it's basically just a number 10 coffee can. And he had the entire decal made and wrapped it on there. And yeah, you can just tell by the discoloration and the fading signatures, it's, it's seen a few hockey games. Cross-ice, Carrick shoots, scores! 3-2, Sam Carrick with a rifle. Yeah, you know, you can tell if the crowd is, uh, you know, into it, you can definitely tell, especially if we, we pull out the paraphernalia. And uh, there's a couple of players that have mentioned to me, hey, we really appreciate that, you know. And, and I'd like to think that we also uh, sometimes, especially if, if a goalie's really just getting hammered, that um, we're helping get into his head a little bit mm -hmm. and kind of get him frustrated. We're, we're definitely trying to negatively get into the head of our opponent. You'll definitely hear it anytime the rain comes to town. You know, that's just, it's just the way it is. And every now and then we'll get in the goalie's head and you can tell he'll turn around and kind of look at us and wish we weren't sitting there, but that's hockey, folks. It's definitely, it's, it's such a fun extra part of the game for us. Right, uh, right. It's a very big responsibility to wield this can. Yeah, the can is cool and the megaphone is cool. So whatever happens, if, if he kicks off first, I'll take the can. If I kick off, I'll give him the megaphone. But other than that, they have to stay together, I think. Obviously, we miss that passion. And of course, we look forward to the sights and sounds of an arena full of goals fans like those characters. We'll keep you updated on when that might be. That'll do it for this show. We'll see you again next week when we catch up with head coach Kevin Deneen. I'm Andy Zilch. For the rest of the cast and crew, thanks for watching Gulls All Access.